to the world. But hardly two years after the great triumph, tragedy struck the house of Edison. He tried to lose himself in work, but to the great giver of light, Menlo Park was full of shadows now. He had to move away, away from the place where he had lived for eight happy years. Two years after Mary Edison died, he found a haven in West Orange, New Jersey, in the lordly house called Glenmount. In the year 1886, he was 39 years old when he married Nina Miller, herself the daughter of an inventor. My later courtship was carried on by telegraph. I taught the lady of my heart Morse code, and we got along much better than we could have with spoken words by tapping our remarks to one another on our hands. Presently, I asked her thus if she would marry me. The word yes is an easy one to send by telegraphic signals, and she sent it. And here he took his new bride to live. Beyond the fields of Glenmont, just down the road, he built his new laboratory, brick this time, the finest invention factory in the world, the big brother of Menlo Park. The nerve center of the compound was the old man's roll-top desk in an office that was two stories high, crammed with 10,000 scientific volumes. It was his combination office, laboratory, studio, library, and bedroom. On a small cot, he took his famous cat naps. I never found need of more than four or five hours sleep in the 24. People talk of loss of sleep as a calamity. They better call it loss of time, vitality, opportunity. No matter how hard he worked, he could always find time for his children. When they were away, he wrote them playful letters to be read in a mirror. On one of their toys, the wheel of light now caught his fancy. It occurred to me that it was possible to devise an instrument that should do for the eye what the phonograph did for the ear. His first idea was to put a continuous line of tiny photographs on a cylindrical shell, just like a photograph record, then to rotate the shell and let the eyes look at the photograph through a magnifying glass. It didn't work well enough to suit Edison. Then he thought, if he could put a long line of photographs on some sort of strip or tape, on something you could roll up. One day, he saw an advertisement for a new kind of camera designed by a man named George Eastman. It took pictures on celluloid. Without George Eastman, I don't know what the result would have been in the history of the motion picture. He tried to develop a narrow strip of sensitized film that would operate on a roll. Observe, says the legend, that each picture has a slight change of position as it passes the point of vision. The rapid photograph of these different stages of movement upon a long strip of light-sensitive film creates the illusionary spectacle of movable figures.
In order to see the figures move, you look through the magnifying glass of a peephole machine. Our studio was almost as amazing as the pictures we made in it. It was such an ungainly looking structure when it was done, and the boys had so much sport with it that we called it the Black Mariah. In order to make certain of as long a working day as possible, we swung the whole building on pivots, like an old-fashioned river bridge, so it could be turned to follow the course of the sun. It was a ghastly proposition for a stranger daring enough to brave its mysteries. But we managed to make pictures there, and after all, that was the real test. They made pictures there. Fred Ott Sneeze, the first copyrighted film. May Irwin and John Rice, the first movie kiss. The story of an American fireman, the first story film. Did you know that one of my first thoughts for the motion picture was to combine it with the phonograph? My plan was to synchronize the camera and phonograph so as to record sounds when the pictures were made and reproduce the two in harmony. Talking pictures. office he showed the first home movies. 